All righty, gang, we are back for part two of the lecture associated with January 10th. Um, that is the, the Monday of this week. We uh, recorded and posted the first part of this lecture and then had to rush out, take my son to the doctor. These are some things that just happened. Um, apologies for the inconvenience, but we're going to flip back over to the document camera and wrap that bad boy up, talking a little bit more about section 2.3 on the limit laws and how you can use them to calculate limits. <clears throat> All right, sorry, I'm getting sick myself. Um, we're gonna make this work though. So this is MAC2311 section 004, which is Calc 1, and we are on the day 1, 10, 22. This is part two. The title card for part one doesn't say part one because I didn't know when I started it that it would be part one, but hey, here we are. Um, so continuing. <clears throat> Section 2.3, oh, limit laws. All right. Uh, so I'm not going to write down all those limit laws again. Um, I gave them to you in the previous lecture. There were seven of them, I think, all together. And we had a couple of theorems that said, you know, if you have a polynomial, you can calculate the limit just by plugging in. If you have a rational function that you're trying to take the limit of, you can calculate that limit just by plugging in as long as the polynomial downstairs is not equal to zero when you do so. Um, the question is, how do we handle... How do we take limits... <clears throat> of functions to which the limit laws and theorems on part one do not apply. Um, question mark. So specifically, if you have a rational function and the downstairs is zero when you take when you when you plug that number in, um, <clears throat> or if you have a function that is you know not one of the functions discussed there, how can we handle that? One of these we saw previously. We saw last Friday two such examples. Uh, one of them was the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. All right, so here, this function is a rational function. It is a ratio of two polynomials. x squared minus 1 is a polynomial of degree 2. x minus 1 is a polynomial of degree 1. This is a limit of a rational function. The catch is that the downstairs here is equal to zero when you plug in x equals one, right? <clears throat> uh, so this guy, the rational function f of x equals x squared minus one over x minus one has zero downstairs When we plug x equals one. So what do? Right? That's the, the sort of obvious question here. The theorems from last time said if you're trying to take the limit of a rational function, you can just plug that number into the rational function. That will work just fine as long as the downstairs of the rational function isn't zero. What if it is? <clears throat> when we looked at this last time, the way we did the calculation is by saying, okay, I'm just going to do some algebra with this thing. Now notice my notation. I'm writing the limit at every step. You need to do that as well. And when two objects are equal, I'm going to put an equal sign in between them. You should do that as well. <clears throat> Sounds like it's really more phone calls. Oh, my head's going to explode. Okay. 
Alrighty, guys, we're back. Sorry about that. We're trying to get the meds for my son. The doctor said she called it in, but she hadn't called it in yet. It's one of those days. Um, <clears throat> notation. Notation matters. So if you're writing a limit, you need to write the limit at every step. And if you're trying to chain together some things that lead you to your answer, all of which should be equal to each other, you need to put equal signs between them. This is the class where you really learn how to use correct notation. If you do not learn it here, it's going to bite you really, really hard down the line. So please start off early in the semester as you solve these problems, practice writing good notation. This is equal to the limit as x goes to 1 of, and I'm just going to factor the top. We did this on Friday. It's x minus 1 times x plus 1 divided by x minus 1. <clears throat> The x minus 1 downstairs, we can think of as x minus 1 times 1, which allows us to then cancel the shared factor. The only things you can cancel are shared factors, top to bottom. The result is limit x to 1 of x plus 1 over 1. And nobody would write over 1. It's just x plus 1. Um, and now this, I can plug 1 into. If I send x to 1 here, I just get 1 plus 1 which on a good day is two, all right? So this is one of the many tricks that we use to calculate limits of, for example, rational functions when the denominator is equal to zero uh, at, when, you, when you first go to plug in. Um, we'll look at some other examples like this, but I want to um, convey the theorem that this is a special case of. So here we go. The theorem says, If you have two functions that agree everywhere except at x equals a, <clears throat> then the limit as x goes to a of f is the same as the limit x goes to a of g. Uh, and this is just kind of another way of saying that thing that I've been saying all along, that the limit does not care what happens at a. It cares about what happens nearby. So if f and g are identical functions, exact same graph everywhere except exactly at x equals a, then the behavior near a must be the same. <clears throat> um, Generally, when we write this equality, we're assuming that both of those limits exist. But if one were to fail to exist, then as a consequence of this statement, the other one would fail to exist also. So that is an unnecessary hypothesis. And that's illustrated by this theorem here, or sorry, that's illustrated by this example here, because this function and this function are the same everywhere except at x equals 1. I just want to make a little note here. The theorem is illustrated by the example above. f of x there could be thought of as the function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. And g of x is the function x plus 1. <clears throat> the only difference between these two functions, right, this function and this function, is that f is undefined when x is equal to 1. g is defined everywhere, right? So the graph of f looks like this. It's, it's exactly this guy. And we graphed this last time. The function g, his graph, is the same. It just doesn't have the whole. So 
So you see everywhere except at x equals one, these functions are equal to each other. If I set this on top of this, the only place where they differ is right here. The original function f has a whole, the simplified function does not. Um, <clears throat> and that's why it's okay for us to say that these limits are equal. In other words, when you cancel a factor like this, the functions are no longer equal. You have to make a note if you're just doing the algebraic simplification and say this is equal to this except at x equals one. But if you're working with the limits, you can just say this, this limit is equal to this limit is equal to this limit. And that's really a consequence of this theorem. Or you could say that this example illustrates that theorem. Uh, we use this all the friggin' time, specifically in the calculations we're going to do early in chapter three, where we're calculating derivatives. And I've hinted at that a few times. Let me show you what one of those calculations might look like. Okay. So I could say calculate lin h to zero. Um, three plus h squared minus nine over h. Oops, let's back this out, pin up a tiny bit. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is also a rational function. The, the variable here is h, but that's OK. The top is still a polynomial. If I were to foil this all out, this would be a polynomial of degree two. The bottom is a polynomial of degree one. Um, so our first thought would be, can I just plug in zero for h? Now the answer is no, because if you do that, the downstairs is going to be zero, but it's the first thing you should ask. Now, instead, what we're going to do is just what I indicated a second ago. We're going to foil out the top, this 3 plus h all squared. Uh, if you do that, that is 9 plus 6h plus h squared. And then we still have that minus 9. That's the top foiled out. And then we're dividing by h still. Of course, you've got a positive 9 here, and a minus 9 here. Those go away. And we have left lim h to 0, 6h plus h squared over h. And from the numerator, I can factor out an h. So I get lim h to 0, h times 6 plus h over h. And now the top has a factor of h. The bottom is h times 1. Those cancel. And we get lim h to 0, 6 plus h over 1. And everybody would just write 6 plus h for that. And as h goes to 0 here, right, now that that factor of h is gone from the bottom, just like in the previous problem, that problem factor is gone. Uh, now you can plug in whatever you're trying to plug in. So in this case, I'm going to plug in 0 for h. And I get 6 plus 0, or just 6. <clears throat> and this particular calculation does turn out to be um, a tangent line calculation or a derivative calculation, but you don't need to be able to contextualize it like that for now. You just need to understand these algebra steps. This is where I normally pause and ask for questions, but since we're just recording the lecture, I'm going to pause for you to ponder, perhaps. Okay. More examples. <clears throat> Uh, you may recall that um, to say a limit exists means that the left and right limits are equal. There are some instances where we calculate the overall limit by looking specifically at the left and right limits, not just when dealing with a graph. For example, I could ask you to calculate the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value of x. And if you remember what the graph of the absolute value function looks like, you can get there by using that. <clears throat> or you can use the definition. And if this is not a definition that you remember, it is one that you should cook into your brain now. 
the absolute value of x or some stuff, anything in there really, is technically defined to be a piecewise function. We split it up into two cases, whether the stuff inside the absolute value is negative or stuff inside the absolute value is non-negative. Non-negative is the term for greater than or equal to zero. If the stuff inside is non-negative, if I want to take the absolute value of a number that is not negative, you just leave the number alone. <clears throat> if, however, you want to take the absolute value of a negative number, you need to make that negative number positive. That's what absolute value does. The way you do that is by multiplying by another negative. So what this says is if you're trying to take the absolute value of a number, if that number is positive, the absolute value is just that number. If that number is negative, you multiply by another negative to make it positive. So we can calculate the left and right limits separately from the definition. Right, this definition. Meaning I will look at the limit as x goes to zero from the left of the absolute value of x and the limit as x goes to zero from the right of the absolute value of x. And again, if you remember the graph, this might seem trivial, but it's important you run through this exercise with me because I'm going to elaborate on it in the next. If I'm sending x to zero from the left, that means I'm considering x values that are slightly to the left of zero, right? Slightly smaller than zero. If you are slightly to the left of zero, you are negative. So in this case, since I'm taking the limit as x goes to zero from the left, I'm considering x values that are negative, which means I need to use this part of the definition. All of your limit laws work just fine with one-sided limits, right? Overall limits, one-sided limits, doesn't matter. Those limit laws apply to all of them. So this is now just a, a technically a polynomial. So you can calculate the limit just by plugging in. This would be negative zero, which on a good day is zero. <clears throat> on the other hand, if I'm taking the limit as x goes to zero from the right, that means I'm considering x's that are just to the right of zero, a little bit bigger than zero, i.e. positive. This would mean, according to the definition above, if x is just a little bit bigger than zero, then the absolute value of x is just x. So that is the limit as x goes to zero plus of x. Again, x is just a polynomial. Theorems from the previous lecture hold here. So this would just be zero. And since the left and right limits are equal, both being zero, the overall limit is also zero, i.e. the limit we're asked to calculate, lim x to zero, absolute value of x is indeed zero, right? That's, that's essentially what we've shown here. <clears throat> and yeah, if you remember the graph, this is utterly trivial. Here's the graph of the absolute value function. Of course, whether you're walking in from the left or from the right, both sides are going to zero as x goes to zero. Um, this graph, though, is a consequence of this definition, right? This is, this is the line y equals negative x. And my function behaves like that everywhere to the left of zero. This is the line y equals positive x. And my function behaves like that everywhere to the right of zero. <clears throat> OK, the reason I said this is an important example uh, is because my last little toy here to play with, I'm going to 
investigate then x to zero absolute value of x divided by x itself All right and by investigate i mean figure out if it exists or not if it exists tell me what it is if it does not exist tell me why more than one way to attack this i'm going to begin with that definition that the absolute value of x is this piecewise function. It's negative x if x is less than zero, and it's positive x if x is greater than or equal to zero. This implies if I divide through by x everywhere, <clears throat> That means I divide this piece by x and I divide this piece by x. So I'll have negative x over x if x is less than zero and positive x over x if x is greater than zero. I'm changing from greater than or equal to to greater than because this function is undefined at zero, right? Again, that's the challenge here. This is undefined at zero. If you plug zero in the bottom of zero, so to divide through an a, a piecewise function, any piecewise function by x or by whatever, you just divide each of the pieces by x or whatever. Now I can look at the left and right limits separately. <clears throat> the limit as x goes to zero from the left of absolute value x over x Again, I'm sending x to zero from the left, which means I'm considering x's that are a little bit smaller than zero, i.e. negative x's. This is the limit as x goes to zero from the left of this piece, because my function behaves like this piece if x is less than zero. So that's negative x over x. And I, like before, I'm just gonna put this in parentheses to make it clear. It's the limit of that whole thing. Now, negative x over x, the x's cancel. This is the limit as x goes to zero from the left of negative one. <clears throat> and now you're taking the limit of a constant. Again, those limit rules from the previous uh, lecture apply. Limit of a constant is just that constant. I suppose a comma is more appropriate here. And if I look at the limit as x goes to yeah. zero from the right of absolute value x over x, I'm considering x's which are positive, a little bit bigger than zero. So I'll be using the second part of my piecewise function. This is lim x to zero plus of positive x over x. And positive x over x is equal to one, as long as x is not exactly equal to zero. So this is lim x to zero plus positive one. And again, the limit of a constant is that constant. So this is just one. Therefore, the overall limit, lim x to zero, absolute value of x over x does not exist because the left and right limits are not equal. Okay, <clears throat> so there's nothing too bad going on here. All of this stuff is, is pretty tractable. Um, I think as long as you take your time and you have the algebra background that, that hopefully you have coming out of, out of pre-calculus, you'll find these really quite manageable. Um, I'd like to take a look at just maybe one or two more problems in here. Uh, yeah, these are the exercises that I just had us go through. Oh yeah, we should describe the squeeze theorem. Let's do that. I forgot that that's in this section. Oh. 
Okay. Before we get to the squeeze theorem, there's a, a slightly more basic theorem that says that limits obey inequalities. If f of x is less than or equal to g of x, and it doesn't have to be everywhere, just for all x near a, Certainly, if this is always true, then the following is true as well, but we only need it to be true near A, then the limit as x approaches A of f of x will be less than or equal to the limit as x approaches A of g of x. In other words, limits obey inequalities. If you have an inequality like this, you can take limits everywhere, and that will still be true. This leads us to our last theorem of the day, which is called the squeeze theorem. Uh, in France, they call this the policeman theorem. And the, the way it's described there is like this. If you're walking down the street and there is a policeman behind you and also a policeman in front of you, and both of them are going to the police station, then you are also going to the police station. All right, it's a little bit silly, but it makes sense. The way we say this is if, um, I'll use slightly different notation, uh, let's say g1 of x is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to g2 of x. And this again could be qualified as for all x near x equals a. Um, and the limit as x approaches a of g1 is the same as the limit as x approaches a of g2. Say they're both equal to some number l. Then the limit as x approaches a of f of x is also equal to L. The instance where you use this theorem is if you have some function f of x that you want to take the limit of, but it's badly behaved. Maybe it oscillates a lot, like the sine 1 over x we talked about earlier, or something like that. Somehow the limit of f is difficult. But you're able to find functions g1 and g2 that bound your function f from below and from above, such that g1 and g2 have the same behavior near a. If you are able to do that, then you can conclude that your function also has that same behavior near a. There is a picture that goes with this. <clears throat> so let's try to draw that. Okay. All right, here's my function f. Maybe it's oscillating really wildly, but it appears to have some sort of reasonable behavior near a. This is f. If I'm able to find a function that bounds f from above, This would be g2. And another function that bounds f from below, this would be g1. And both of those bounding functions have the same behavior near a, namely they're, they're both going to l, then f must also go to l. That's that's the picture. That's the general idea here. Um, your book has a, an image that illustrates this. You might want to take a look at that. Roughly the same thing. Yeah, 
here's the idea. They use different labels. They use uh, F, G, and H, but I, I like to use this uh, G1, F, and G2 because it helps you remember that F, the guy in the middle, is the one you're working with. G1 and G2, these are functions that you come up with. So the classic example here, that sine of one over X, the limit as X goes to zero of him, uh, just straight up does not exist. There's really nothing we can do to help that. But, I can try to calculate the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x. <clears throat> now, your first thought might be to just try and plug in 0 for x. But if you do that, this piece goes to 0, right? 0 squared is 0. This piece, the one over x, is undefined. So you'd have zero times the sine of something that is undefined. That's a real problem. So first note, you cannot plug in zero. <clears throat> we can use the squeeze theorem here. The idea is that you know the sine of 1 over x piece oscillates rapidly near 0. So he's causing trouble. But the x squared piece is trying to drag everything to 0. The way you use the squeeze theorem is first by coming up with an inequality, right? an inequality like this, where your function is trapped between two well-behaved functions. And the easiest way to come up with this is to observe that negative 1 is less than or equal to the sine of anything, in particular, the sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to 1, right? The range of the sine function is negative 1 to 1, no matter what you put inside of it. Sine can never spit out anything smaller than negative 1, nor can sine ever spit out anything bigger than positive 1. So regardless of what you have in here, the sign of that thing is always trapped between negative one and one. My goal, remember, is to make my function f show up in the middle here. My function is x squared times sine of one over x. This is, this is f of x here, mostly f. Of x. So I multiply through by x squared, and I get negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared times the sine of one over x is less than or equal to positive x squared. So now here is my g1. Here is my function f of x trapped in the middle, the function I want the limit of. And here is the positive bounding function g2. Also, if you take the limit as x goes to 0 of both of those bounding functions, Lim x to 0 of negative x squared. That, by my limit laws, is negative 0 squared. 0 squared is 0, so that's negative 0, which is 0. And if I look at the limit as x goes to 0 of my other bounding function, x squared, this is just 0 squared. Again, plugging in, because it's a polynomial, I can plug in. 0 squared is 0. Thus, by the inequality, this one, and squeeze theorem, the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x must also be zero, right? My function is trapped between two functions, each of which go to zero as x goes to zero. So by the squeeze theorem, my function must also go to zero. <clears throat> I can illustrate this particular limit for you in Desmos. And that looks like this.
is x squared times the sine of 1 over x. Kind of hard to see what's going on here until you zoom in, but here's my function. You see it wobbles back and forth really, really fast. It does a lot of nasty shit, but it looks like it's still going to zero. And indeed it is. Here's my function that bounds from below, right? Negative x squared is a function that will bound this red function from below. And here's my function that bounds from above. And indeed, we see that the red is trapped between the blue and the green. Since the blue and the green both go to zero as x goes to zero, the red must also go to zero. And that's precisely what we're saying here. All right, so this is how you make use of the squeeze theorem, which is one of those important things. We're going to use this a little bit later on um, <clears throat> when we go to do certain derivative calculations. OK, uh, and that's the example that they work. So let's see, do we want to do, let's do one or two others here. Um, we can do one where we're just calculating stuff with the limit laws. We did one like that earlier. I don't mind doing another. And then we can do one where we have to do a little bit of algebra to sort things out, maybe like 23. All right, so we'll go ahead and do number nine and number 23 to wrap things up. Uh, maybe one more space theorem problem. We'll see. Start number nine. I'm just going to write this down and we'll come back to the dot cam lim x to 2 square root of 2x squared plus 1 over 3x minus 2. <clears throat> this is all under the radical. Here we go. So if you just look at the inside here, this is a rational function. But with the square root on the outside, it's not a rational function. But that square root is a positive uh, power. It's a, or just a, a power. So maybe I'll begin by writing this as lim x to 2, 2x two squared plus 1 over 3x minus 2, all raised to the 1 half power. Then by one of our theorems from part one, the limit can come inside the power. This is lim x to 2, 2x two squared plus 1 over 3x minus 2 with the power outside. So the limit comes in. Right? This was one of our limit laws. Now the thing inside here is a rational function. So I can apply my theorem that says to calculate the limit of a rational function, you can just plug the x value in as long as it doesn't make the downstairs 0. And here, 3x minus 2, that's not going to be 0 on x is 2. That's 6 minus 2 is 4, just like that other example we did. Upstairs, I'll have 2 times 2 squared plus 1. I'll write the whole thing divided by 3 times 2 minus 2. Again, all to the 1 half. Follow your order of operations. 2 squared, that's the power in here we're going to deal with first. So that's 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9, divided by 3 times 2 is 6, minus 2 is 4, all to the 1 half. And when you take 9 fourths and raise it to the 1 half power, that's the same as taking the square root of 9 fourths. And you do that by taking the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. That's 3 halves. OK, so nothing crazy going on here. Really, we're just plugging in. If you just come back here and plug in 2 for x, this is what you'll get. <clears throat> we said we we're also going to take a peek at 23. I know that these big compound fraction things can intimidate. So let's start there. We've got lim x to 3. And then upstairs, I have 1 over x minus 1 third. Downstairs, I have x 
minus three. So coming back to my document camera, this is what we're working with now. If you try to plug in three for X, this downstairs is gonna be zero. The top would also be zero, but zero over zero is not one. You cannot cancel zeros over zeros. We've mentioned that before. <clears throat> I cannot yet factor anything from this numerator. That's also worth observing. Now, there's no obvious way to factor that. So if we want to calculate this limit, and often it's the case, if you want to calculate a limit and you cannot get it by plugging in right away, you just need to do some algebra. You need to simplify. If somebody handed me that ratio, even without the limit here, I would say, my God, you need to clean that up. This is quite ugly. The way you clean this up is by having a common denominator between the two terms in the numerator. So I'm gonna leave the denominator alone. That's just X minus three. Upstairs, I need the denominator to be the same. <clears throat> this one has a factor of X, this one has a factor of three. So uh, I need to multiply top and bottom here by three. This is three over three X minus. Here I need to multiply top and bottom by X and I'll get x over 3x. And now that I have a common denominator, I can just subtract the two fractions. So I get lim x to 3. This will be 3 minus x divided by 3x, all divided by x minus 3. And when you see compound fractions like this, you need to identify kind of which one is the bigger fraction, um, and then put the tops and bottoms of that in parentheses. So here, this is my big numerator. This is my big denominator, right? And without those parentheses, there's ambiguity here. Division is not associative. <clears throat> it matters. All right, we're almost done. Our next step, this is just more more basic algebra simplification, but I know it's stuff that we need practice with because I've graded many pre-calculus and Calc 1 tests. I have this fraction, which I'm trying to divide by x minus 3. That's the same thing as taking that fraction, 3 minus x over 3x, and multiplying by the reciprocal of the bottom. <clears throat> so think of x minus 3 as x minus 3 over 1, right? Big fraction, top and bottom, both in parentheses flip and multiply by the bottom, leave the top alone. And you get this. So when you multiply fractions, you multiply straight across. This is limit x approaches 3 of 3 minus x divided by 3x times x minus 3. And there's one little trick I have to show you here. And it has to do with the relationship between this factor and this factor. The general rule, and you will like this because it will save you time, you can remember that a minus b is always the same as negative parentheses b minus a. Try it out. If you distribute this negative, you get negative b and then negative negative a is positive a. So this is negative b plus a, which is the same as a minus b. In other words, I can factor a negative out from the top. Three minus x is the same as negative x minus three. And then my downstairs is still three x times x minus three. Having done that, I can cancel the x minus threes. Can't do it before, can do it now. I cannot cancel this three with this three. I cannot cancel this x with this x. That shit doesn't work. You can only cancel common factors and three is not a factor of the top. X is not a factor of the top. But if you factor out a negative one from this numerator, it becomes negative parentheses x minus three according to this rule. And now you have a factor of x minus 3 upstairs and downstairs that can cancel. And we're left taking the limit as x goes to 3 of this negative means negative 1 upstairs over 3x is all that's left downstairs. And as I send x to 3 in this expression, 
I get negative one over three times three, which is negative one over nine. <clears throat> Okay, so just a few basic algebra tricks, things that you will get lots of practice with as you work through the homework. Um, let's look for a good squeeze down problem to wrap up with. It's hard to find good squeeze down problems that aren't totally trivial. Uh, 37 looks fun. Suppose that 4x minus 9 is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to x squared minus 4x plus 7. <clears throat> and we want to find, uh, so this is for all x greater than or equal to zero. Find the limit as x approaches four of f of x. Okay. Well, here I have an inequality that looks an awful lot like the inequalities from the squeeze theorem. And I'm told that this inequality is true for all x is greater than zero. In particular, it's definitely true near four. <clears throat> so we can try the squeeze theorem. The hard part has already been done. We already have the inequality. We already know this. And since that's true for all x is greater than zero, it must be true for all x near four, right? Four is over here to the right of zero. So it's true everywhere to the right of zero. It's definitely true everywhere near four. Let's look at the limit of the outer functions, lim x to four of four x minus nine. <clears throat> This again is a polynomial, so you can take the limit just by plugging in. So it's going to be 4 times 4 minus 9, which is 16 minus 9. And 16 minus 9 is 7. We can take the look at the limit as x goes to 4 of the function on the right x squared minus 4x plus 7. <clears throat> Again, polynomial, just plug in. So that's 4 squared minus 4 times 4 plus 7, which is 16 minus 16 plus 7, which is just 7. So by the squeeze theorem, Since the limit of the outer functions are the same, they both go to seven, the limit of the middle function, f of x, must also be seven. Right? That's how the squeeze theorem works. If the two outer functions, if you have an inequality, which you know is true, at least everywhere near your number that you're trying to send x to, if you know that inequality is true everywhere near four, and this function and this function both go to seven as x goes to four, then f of x being trapped between them must also go to seven as x goes to four. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. I'll upload this to YouTube. This is your lesson 2.3. Um, there is a homework set that I will go ahead and, and get up for you guys now. Please work on that a little bit between today and Wednesday. On Wednesday, I'll do my best to answer any questions you had from these video lectures. And then we'll move on, practice a little bit more limits and start talking about derivatives, hopefully. So, um, oh no, continuity. Continuity is next. Derivatives still a little way off, but yeah, that's it. Okay, take care, guys.